I was born in a car. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it had been abandoned, but it was like this old farmhouse. I think there was even like a fox and a raccoon, that, you know, one on the ground floor, one upstairs. <laughs> so why work so hard all your life to have these achievements when it doesn't lead to the place you think it will, namely happiness and fulfillment? Into a trades program, specifically welding. So I applied for that and I was accepted. This person had used video recording technology to do something bad and illegal. I was going to use the settlement to do good. This was supposed to be a husband and wife Q&A, but my husband is just really busy these days trying to finish some renovations and um, it's virtually impossible for us to sit down together and actually film. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to film my question and answer session at the first part of the video and then I'm going to hunt him down and make him answer the questions that you all want to know about wherever he happens to be that day. So uh, that's what I'm going to do, I think. Okay, so the first question. Where were you born? I was born in a car. I'm not kidding. <laughs> in the hospital parking lot in a car. That's where I was born. I actually made the front page of the local newspaper for that. I don't remember what they put for headline. It's like, this baby was in a rush. I'm still in a rush. <laughs> Not much has changed. Anyways, I was born in the province of Ontario, Canada. I still live in Canada. We live in Canada. I'm Canadian. Cheers. You mentioned you grew up off the grid and homeschooled. Can you tell us more about what that was like? My parents bought a farm the year that I was born. It was like this old farmhouse. It was on 200 acres, so I had a large um, plot of land that came with it. See, some people have, uh, how do you call those things that fly up? Drone. Drone? Some people buy a lift. Yep, exactly. <laughs> the farm was built in like, I don't know, the 1800s, so it was this big stone house that had no insulation in it. Uh, it was plaster, lath and plaster walls with like horse hair to hold the plaster together. And it was in rough shape. Like it was, it had been abandoned. It had been sitting for, I don't know how many decades before my parents bought it. Um, it was, it was not in good shape. And I think there was even like a fox and a raccoon that, you know, one on the ground floor, one upstairs. <laughs> they shared the place. Uh, so yeah, there was like animals that had uh, made their home there. And it was beyond the boundary of where the power lines ended. It was on a gravel road out in the middle of nowhere, basically, and it was wonderful. But it was definitely challenging. I mean, this is something that my, I think more so my dad, but my mom was also in agreement that they should live this way. Um, they wanted a quiet lifestyle. And there's a child calling me. I tell ya, you know, nap times are just not long enough sometimes. It's just... Oh, yeah. Okay, so, off the grid and homeschooled, yes. So, I don't know how my parents managed it. Like, think about it. No slow cooker, no food processor, no laundry machine. My mom, so because we didn't have a laundry machine at the at the house. She oh don't touch it. Don't touch it. This is my Yeah. Oh. She all our laundry got collected throughout the week and she would go once a week to the laundromat in town. It was twenty kilometers um, away from our house. And she would schlep ten, eleven loads of laundry every week to the laundromat and be there for I don't know how long but like just washing all the clothes, drying all the clothes and that was her routine for years, years and years uh, wow it was important to my parents that they would have enough space to raise their kids and be able to grow a lot of their own food and so that's what they did we had very large gardens that we would plant and harvest all the food from that and that's what we would eat uh, I mean, we would shop at the store too, but um, a lot of the food we ate was stuff that we had grown ourselves. 
so it was organic and we also milked uh, a cow so I grew up um, milking a cow <laughs> I know how to do that how we cooked was a propane stove and also our fridge was propane it was from a don't touch it it was from an RV for lights we had kerosene lamps and candles and the and for heat we had um, a wood stove for water so we were on a well uh, obviously there was no sewer connection or city water we were on a well we also had a cistern under the floor and this cistern it would collect rain water from the roof of the house there was like a way for it to get down from the eaves trough and go down into this big concrete cistern that was under the floor so that water we would use to flush the toilet and to wash with like the the rainwater and then the well water was for drinking and for the animals we would give them well water to drink as well when i was 14 years old my dad did uh, purchase and install a solar system so we had uh, solar panels that would track the sun, collect the energy, and be stored in batteries. He eventually got the house wired uh, with plugs and stuff, so we could actually like plug things in and have power. I don't know what the problem was though, but we couldn't plug in um, things that had a high draw. So uh, if we wanted to like straighten our hair or dry our hair with a hair dryer that would not the system would not run those things so we would have to turn the generator on as a backup to um use those uh sorts of things we had cows chickens pigs uh sheep goats uh rabbits dog cats what did i miss ducks we had ducks so it was sort of like a hobby farm um type of farm. One of the things I loved to do the most as a child, so we had these big round um, hay feeders for the cows uh, in the winter and my dad would fill it with a hay bale, like you put a hay bale inside the feeder and the cows would all come around, stick their heads through the openings for, the, for their heads and I would, as a child, I loved to go and climb up in the feeder sit in the hay like I would make myself a nice little comfortable nest in the hay and just like feed the cows pet them talk to them like it was it was so much fun and I loved it I could just sit there for hours I loved to do that it was like one of my favorite pastimes as a child I heard the dog yelp and something squeaked and it went flying up in the air so it must have got a hold of her face Hi. Uh, grabbed the dog. Where's the kitty? Over there by the wheel. Stay here, kitty, kitty, kitty. It's hiding from you. We were also homeschooled. So my parents homeschooled all of us. My mom was our teacher and my dad helped out, but my mom was teaching all of us at home and I never went to elementary or high school and I loved it. I thought it was great. So we had no TV, um, no computer. I remember my childhood being a lot of fun, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. You know, I'm very in tune with the seasons and the cycle of life. And that was, I mean, I think that was really good to be exposed to as a child. I wish I could provide that for my own children. We live in the city now, so obviously we don't live on a farm. Um, but we do have a garden. I try to teach them about um, cultivating the soil and plants and growing things and for food. I think it is so, so healthy for children to learn those things and have those skills and just to be able to observe the wonder of creation you know that you can plant a seed and have it produce a hundredfold it's just, it's truly incredible so um yeah so that's what uh, that was my childhood more or less i could go on and on with stories of the farm like it was so there was stuff happening all the time good and bad um but yeah 
Okay, and now the little mister is awake too. Little mister. You want to say hi to everyone? He just woke up too. Anyway, so. Next question. What was your first job? Uh, so I would do babysitting when I was uh, a kid, once I was old enough to do it. I would babysit my siblings also for my parents. Uh, they would go on like date nights. This was when I was older, you know, when I was like somewhat responsible. One summer I was hired by friends of my parents to clear fields with one of my brothers. So they hired us to um, basically like come and cut down everything that was growing uh, in a field. They wanted to make the field into a hay field or like even just pasture. I don't know what they were doing with it, but uh, they wanted all the brush, all the, um, what do you call it? You know, the ones with thorns on it? What is it called? Ugh. Prickly ash. Prickly ash. That's what it is. Prickly ash grows everywhere here. It has thorns on it. It's like this shrubby bush that grows uh, like mad here cedars, whatever. Anyways, whatever was growing in the field, they wanted us to come and cut it down, clear it out, dig up the root walls, whatever, get rid of it. So <laughs> we did that. It was fairly hard work. I think it was about 13, but they paid pretty well. So that was good. But the first like real job that I had was uh, at a truck stop uh, in town and I would work every Saturday and I had to ride my bike. My parents didn't want to drive me. so. <laughs> I would ride my bike 20 kilometers, uh, do my shift. I was a dishwasher first, and then I moved into um, attending the buffet. So like bringing food out, making sure it was clean and that there was enough uh, of all the food that was supposed to be on the buffet. Um, and I also did like some prep cooking after a while. Uh, I don't remember how long I had that job. That was when I was... Um, 16. I started working at 16 uh, at that job. And then when I was 18, I got a job on a local cruise ship. I was a deckhand for them. This was like a cruise ship that would go, it would travel the Trent Severn waterway and across Lake Ontario and then up the Rideau Canal to Ottawa. But we would just, they would do these five day cruises. Uh, five or seven days just going up and down these different waterways and that was like I loved that job it was so much fun loved it I was really into like boating and sailing I got my boat license um, from my days uh, as a cadet I was a sea cadet uh, for a few years when I was a teenager and at that time like I really had a passion for sailing and boating and all this being on the water um, so this job was just it was perfect for me Next question, higher education. I did not go to university. I did go to trade school instead. I, my parents were always very upfront about the fact that they would not be paying for university for their kids. They told us all along that if we wanted to go to university, it was on us to save the money and to pay for it. I had a bank account since I was like six years old. Any money I got from like my grandparents, from gifts people would give uh, for birthdays or something, monetary gifts, I would save that, put it in the bank account. Um, any money I got from like cadet camp, I would do the camps in the summer and they would pay you uh, a small amount. When I was 19, so this would have been 2008, 2007, around there. I decided that I was going to do online school uh, rather than go to live on the campus of a university. I would just take classes and stay. I was actually living with my grandmother at the time, but I did not want to pay for like dorm, like to live on campus of a university. So I decided I would do online school. I was serious about doing it, wanted to do it, and then did not end up doing it. <laughs> And I saw an advertisement for the University of Guelph. They were advertising a pilot program. It was the first time they were doing this. Uh, they were trying to recruit women and immigrants into a trades program, specifically welding. So I applied for that and I was accepted. 
and this was back when the University of Guelph had a campus in Kempville. I don't know if they still do, but they did at the time. It was called a pre-apprenticeship program, so once I was finished the program, I got a job, and it was a good job. It was a very good company. They hired me right out of school, and I was signed up as an apprentice for them, so I was working with people that were more experienced, like certified, licensed uh, welders and tradespeople. So I was able to hone my skills uh, there. I did work as a welder for about four years, different companies. I was uh, doing welding for them, so. Okay, next question. Were, what were you like as a teenager? Were you rebellious? No, I would not say that I was rebellious, but I did have questions. And at a young age, I already, I understood that being rich, being wealthy, and having status was not the way to a fulfilling life. And I grew up in a Christian community, Christian people around me. I was raised in a Christian home as well. My parents, that's the religion that I was raised in. Um, although I am Jewish now, for anyone who hasn't seen any of my previous videos, I uh, just wanted to point that out. So I had questions about life. Why was I born? What are we doing here? What is this world and this life all about? Because to me, it didn't seem that getting saved was the answer, the end all be all of life. I felt that there must be a reason, a purpose, and I wanted to know what it was. I remember I would hear stories of like rich, famous people that had everything. Okay, uh, Robin Williams comes to mind, um, Anthony Bourdain, the, uh, the chef, famous chef. I mean, these people had everything. They were famous, they were celebrities, they had families, money, you name it. And they killed themselves. As a child, you would read stories like this of people that had it all, but decided that life was not worth living. And to me, that just didn't seem right. And I remember this making a powerful impact on me. I really wanted to know why this happens and why these people, why they decided to, to go this route. And to me, it was just abundantly obvious that any of those things, being famous, being rich, having it all is not the answer. Why work so hard all your life to have these achievements when it doesn't lead to the place you think it will, namely happiness and fulfillment? I don't know. You can have a certain goal, but how do you know that achieving that goal is going to bring you the happiness and the fulfillment that you're looking for? How do you know? How do you know that it's all not just a big waste of time? You climb the ladder to success and you realize that your ladder was leaned up against the wrong building. You know? How do you know your ladder is leaning against the right building and that what's at the top of the ladder is what you really want? Anyway, so that was like my observations on life at a young age and why I set out to find the answers. And my baby's crying again. I gotta go pick him up. So these questions and the fact that they were not satisfactorily answered and my deep unease with some of the Christian ideology and practices uh, caused me to make decisions such as mm, stop attending church, stop to do uh, communion, or drinking the juice and eating the little crouton. Um, I stopped doing that at a young age. And these things may have seemed like acts of rebellion against the religion of my parents, but looking back now, it was, it was just part of my journey. And it was a way for me to distance myself from that religion. I also think it's pretty normal for kids that age. Um, when you hit your teens, you start asking these existential questions. So I don't think it was anything out of the ordinary. I never threw the baby out with the bathwater. I always believed there was a God. I always believed there was morality and there was right and wrong and there was such a thing as truth. And I just didn't know what it was. I feel like my mid-teens up until the time that I discovered Judaism was basically just a quest for meaning and purpose and for the truth. And once I discovered Judaism, then 
I had my questions answered. I found such a passion and a love for God and for Judaism. Not to say it was easy or that it was a smooth journey. It definitely was not. It had its ups and downs but I never imagined I would be as happy as I am. I'm nowhere near where I would like to be with my learning, but that's part of the beauty of the journey, is always striving to be better, to grow, to grow in your knowledge, to keep striving for more, so. Okay, next question. How did you and your husband meet? And how did you know he was the one? So this was when I was working as a welder. I worked for a company in Ottawa and one day a coworker, a friend of mine, she invited me to go shopping with her at the nearby shopping center for a birthday gift for her boyfriend. And I said, sure. And if there's one place that I almost never go is the mall. I do not like going to the mall. I don't know what it is about them. Just so much materialism and uh, advertisement and people that look like they forgot to get dressed. But anyways, I agreed to go shopping with her to the mall to look for a gift. So we go shopping and she sees something at a shop that catches her eye and she goes over and, and looks and she also had a birthday coming up so I could see that she was interested in this item. So I tell her that I will purchase it for her as a birthday gift for my friend. Wow. And the salesman that took my payment was this cute man that he was nice and friendly. And on the back of the receipt, he just put his name and number. We had chatted a bit like while we were looking at um, the things that were for sale there and he was nice and seemed interesting and I wasn't dating anyone at the time, so. A couple days later, I texted his number and I said, Hey, do you remember me? It's the girl from the mall. And he answered me, he called me back, and we talked for quite a while on the phone. He told me all about himself, basically, and I did the same. We really hit it off, like, from the very beginning. So this was in January of 2011, it was the winter time, and the Rideau Canal in Ottawa, uh, they turn it into, like, this big skating rink in the winter. So I was going to go skating with a group of my friends and so I invited him. I didn't realize at the time that him being Israeli, he did not know how to ice skate. Being Canadian, I grew up ice skating. I was basically lived at the pond and I grew up skating. Kudos to him for just standing out on the ice for like hours. That was our first date. And then afterwards he invited me to his place and his mom was actually visiting from Israel at the time and so I got to meet his mom basically the day, the night of after our first date and we, because of the language barrier, we weren't really able to talk to each other but she seemed nice and I was, I was really glad that I had that opportunity to meet her even at that early stage. I would say that my husband actually knew that I was the one before I knew that he was the one. I knew that he was the person for me, but I didn't know how it was going to work because of the different religions. Even though I wasn't practicing Christianity anymore, I didn't necessarily share his religion or belief systems. I didn't know much about it at the time. So I felt that he was the one, but there was still some logistical issues to be worked out. When he asked me to marry him, we, he took me to the park and got down on one knee and presented me with this huge diamond ring. And I was like, wow, this is, this is beautiful. And yes, I will marry you, but I am going to return the ring. <laughs> and I'm going to use the money to buy a rental property. And this is going to be uh, an investment property for us. I was big into like financial freedom and having a rental property was, I already knew at that age that this was one of the ways to eventually quit your day job. And also my father uh, was a property owner. He didn't have like a regular day job. So my dad was a big influence and inspiration to me as far as uh, real estate investment went. So that's what I told my husband. I said, I'm going to return the ring, 
just go to the pawn shop and buy me any old thing. I think it was like the following year we purchased our first um, rental property together. Okay, next question. What made you start a YouTube channel? So I would say it was around 2017 where I started to have these like initial niggling feelings in my heart that I wanted to start a YouTube channel. I felt that I had knowledge and experience that I could share and possibly help some people and also have it be like a creative outlet for me because uh, being a welder, I really enjoyed the intersection of applying technical skills to the creative field. When I was welding, I took a job with an art studio in Toronto and I was a welder for them and they were doing like these crazy light fixtures and uh, furniture really almost like sculpting in metal that was kind of like around the time where I discovered that I really had this uh, passion for a form of the arts and creativity I really enjoyed that I really enjoyed working with my hands and having what to show for at the end of the day uh, not like an office job where you're just sitting at a computer all day and inputting data or something or um, calling people on the phone, which I did have those types of jobs later on as well. But I found it really enjoyable to work with my hands and actually create something. The problem was I didn't know, I didn't have a clear idea of what I would make the channel about. And so I put it off for a long time. And also I was very busy at that time. I had two young children at the time and just a lot going on. Uh, I also thought that I might end up going to law school. I did actually study and sit, like write the LSAT tests, um, the law school entrance exams, but that didn't end up panning out. Yeah, I put off, I put off YouTube for a long time, but the idea that I wanted to do it just kept growing and growing and growing. The other thing that happened around that time was my mom, I got a call from my mom and she's like, are you sitting down? I was like, yeah. And she asked me, do you remember your old orthodontist from when you had braces? And I said, yeah, of course. And she said, well, the local police have raided his clinic and found that he had been um, illegally recording his underage female patients and your name is on the list of one of these girls. I was like, whoa, wow, what do I do? Like, is it about to do something? Like, what? I don't know. She's like, you have to call the constable in charge of the investigation. He took all my details and he said, you can apply to be part of the class action lawsuit that is going to be moving forward against this person. So I did. I did all of that. I decided at that time that I was going to use video for good. It just seemed like the right thing to do with the money was to invest it in purchasing the tools that would allow me to create something that would help people. This person had used technology and specifically video recording technology to do something bad and illegal. I was going to use the settlement from the court case to do good. And that's what I did. It seemed like poetic justice to me, you know? Can you be quiet so you can make a video? Trying to make a video together? No? <laughs> Who put their own highlighter on today and was a bit heavy handed? Not me. What? Abba? <laughs> Abba's calling us? So I'm trying to do it nicely. It doesn't really work well for me. <laughs> So where are from? I'm from Israel, Jerusalem. I born and raised in Jerusalem. We have four siblings, two sisters, two brothers. My parents are originally from Iraq, Iraq, Kurdish, Syrian. We have some mix there. Why I came to Canada? I thought I'm going to be here for like uh, for a year or two traveling, making money, whatever, go back, buy apartment and back home. And I got stuck. I find my wife and I'm happy. It's good. But there's other shame we'll go back. Why did we decide to get married? So at the beginning, I only decided to get married because Yael wanted to get married. I didn't care too much. I uh, didn't have any, I will say, end goal, right? It was just like, okay, getting married, having kids, 
house. It was no, it just made, like, it was no really meaning to life. It was more doing what everybody does, and that's it. I wanted to make Yael happy. She's pretty, you know, it's my wife. It's my wife. She's the, I guess, the chosen one. So I want to make her happy. How did I know that she's the one? Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I can say that when I met her, it, I was in one level of love and, and appreciation and charm by her, but it's nothing to compare it to today or every day that we see each other or, you know, it's like the relationship with Hashem or with Torah. The more you learn, this is how I see it, the more you learn, the more you dedicate yourself to the relationship. So it's so hard, you know, in Torah it's so hard, but if you do it in the right way, you, you you can't stop so you found love even more and i think i love her way more than i love her, that i ever loved and every day I, I you know it's it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger the the feeling the appreciation the understanding the the everything hashem chooses for us right we just do in our way uh, having kids i love having kids it's great i recommend to every person but if you're not lazy if you're thinking to have kids to save your relationship run away this is not gonna save your relationship having kids it's between healthy relationship between two people do not have kids with someone that you don't have a healthy relationship you're gonna ruin your life and the kids life and we have enough messed up kids my personal opinion uh, so have a good relationship with somebody and have a great guidance from a rabbi a rabbi is really important to have in your life a good rabbi a real rabbi one more question yeah I promise we will do a proper husband and wife Q&A at some future point. It just didn't work out for us this time, but hopefully in the future. Bezrat Hashem. If you haven't seen yet the videos that I made answering questions about my conversion to Judaism or the reasons why I decided to convert to Judaism and that is of interest to you, then I will link the videos right here up on the screen and you can click or tap those if those are of interest to you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.